physical science here. Some of this is going to sound familiar to you. And um, I'm not much for asking you to go back and recount the whole history of the law. I just want you to kind of understand where it came from. Uh, so what we will talk about the primary sources of law, and that will come back to haunt you later too, so that's important to pay attention to. We'll talk about common law, like the book talks about, and the online resources talk about, the Norman Conquest of 1066. I'm not going to ask you what year the Norman Conquest of 1066 is. It would be easy, wouldn't it? 1066. Right. But, but there's no need to. I'm not going to ask you questions like that. I'm more interested in whether you understand what common law is. And by the way, after reading the first chapter, if you could boil it down, what is the common law? You can't hear them right now, but they're all eager to answer me. All their hands are up. Anybody? Common law. Anybody? Anybody? Yeah, well, that, see, that's the thing, is that it, it did have its foundation in English law, but common law is actually the biggest body of law we still have today. So, uh, case law, really. Common law is case law. It's, if it's a case law, then that means it comes from cases, courts, right? So it's decided by who? Judges, juries. That's what common law is. So we'll also look at some of the constitutional clauses uh, that you probably have had in some other class, but focus on how they relate to business. And uh, we'll talk about a little bit about uh, conflict between federal and state law, and, and then look at the uh, Bill of Rights, specifically how those freedoms come out in the First Amendment. Uh, we'll talk about fundamental rights. So, I, mean, I suppose this is necessary to say up front that um, memorizing law is not enough. In fact, I don't know all the law. You heard that, you know, you're presumed to know the law, and ignorance of the law is no excuse. But honestly, how often does something happen and you're like, I didn't know that was against the law? Or, I didn't know what the speed limit is, or something like that. Anybody got a story of something where they got caught doing something, they had no idea that they were doing something wrong? I didn't get caught or anything, but I just found out recently that it is illegal to, if you're making a left turn onto a multiple line, uh -huh. you can't use that center lane. To yeah, do you get a to ticket? To go left. It, I didn't know that. That's only for people who are driving and trying to make left off of the road. Yeah. Yeah, because people pull on that and go forever. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. So yeah, there's some crazy things out there. Uh, I remember one time I went to a meeting at night, and this was Michigan Avenue in Lansing, as it goes up to the Capitol. If anybody knows where this is at, I went into the meeting, and um, when I came out of the meeting, the meeting was probably three or four hours long. Uh, they'd set up a construction zone during the meeting. So I come out and what I thought was my lane of traffic, uh, which was usually like six lanes of traffic, was now down to two lanes. So I kind of zigged into my lane and got out of the construction zone and there was somebody walk jaywalking. It was dark. So I zigged around them uh, the next time. And guess what happened the second time I swerved in my car? No, <laughs> I was trying to hit him, but no, I didn't. I got pulled over. You know, flashers turn on. I'm like, oh boy. I bet they suspect that I'm intoxicated or something. So the guy walks up to the car and he says, um, do you know why I stopped you? Resist the temptation to say, no, don't you? So don't say that. I didn't say that. but um, And then what do they do if they suspect you're intoxicated? Not that you know, but, you know, maybe on TV yeah, you've seen it. Well, you know, he's not to that stage yet. He's trying to smell the odor of intoxicants. He's trying to observe me. He's, you know, he's in my face. And he says, do you know how fast you were going? Again, resist saying, don't you? So um, I said, yes. I. Do you mean right here? And the guy seriously looked at me and he said, 
No, sir, right now you're stopped. <laughs> like, well, I just must be out of my mind. I don't even realize I'm not moving anymore. <laughs> so um, I said, well, the speed limit here is, I think it was 45. And I'd been driving that for years. I mean, I went to Cooley Law School. It's right there. So I knew what I was doing. And he goes, well, yes, but you just went through a construction zone. And the speed limit there was 35. And I said, you're not going to believe this, but of course, the guy thinks I'm intoxicated. He's like, there wasn't a construction zone. Then there was. And, and I came out of the middle of the construction zone. There was no speed limit signs anywhere. So I said, you know, I came out and there were no signs and I didn't know that. Actually, I wasn't paying a lot of attention to it. And he said, well, sir, the law is blah, 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 blah. And I said, oh, I didn't really know that. I might have kind of known that. But, you know, do you always think that? I mean, do you always, like you're driving somewhere, you think, oh, here's the post speed limit, now I'm going through construction zone. And unless it tells you, you're not really looking at your speed anyway. So he says, I need your uh, driver's license and registration. And um, at the time, I actually was a prosecutor, and we carried badges. And um, my boss said, don't ever flash your badge because you'll get fired, right? It's, you know, you, you don't try to get a favor um, if you get in trouble. So I was trying not to point that out or anything. And he uh, came back, and he ran my plates, and he said, uh, you know, your driving record's clear. Um, uh, I need to see your driver's license. And I flipped open my wallet and he saw my badge and he said, you have a good night, sir. And I drove off. So like initially you're thinking, boy, that sucks that he's getting a ticket for something he didn't know. But then when you hear that I got away with it and maybe not, don't have a whole lot of sympathy for me. But I, I didn't get, you know, he really just said, see ya. And uh, I, I didn't know, but that doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because if I could just, if we could just say we don't know what the law is, then what? That's how we get it away with everything. We would say, oh, next time I'll know better. All right. When did, when did you get fired from accidentally showing your badge? Did you, did you go back to A? Yeah, you know, I, I don't know. I, I think the, my boss had just had some real bad experiences with that, you know, like people trying to get away with things. Um, I mean, I suppose if I was driving everywhere at a high rate of speed and then flipping my badge open and say, you don't stop me or something, that'd be different. But All right, so um, uh, another important thing to understand is that when I talk about a business transaction, there may be many, many angles to it. I might be talking about business torts, business contracts. There might be a variety of legal issues that are involved in any business transaction. And even within contracts, lots of different law that uh, may apply. And even outside the law, maybe sometimes it's not a violation of the law, but it's an ethical issue. Other times it's not. I mean, is it immoral or unethical to speed? I don't know. I mean, that one's kind of tough. I mean, I suppose if you know that you're breaking the law and you're trying to get away with it, maybe there's something inside you morally that says, I shouldn't be doing this. Um, I saw a YouTube video the other day of a guy, and I don't know if it was a firebird or something. Did you see this one where he passes the police officer? Police officer has a, a webcam going in, or a camera going in the p patrol car, passes the patrol car probably 120, hits the median, loses control, launches off of the um, divider in the median, and go just like Dukes of Hazard. You guys probably don't remember that show, but into a bridge. Anybody see that? It was in it, like it was nasty. I kept playing it over and over again. What's that? Uh, no. Um, but if we have time, or we have a break. Maybe, or maybe I'll link to it or something. It's wow. I mean, the audacity of somebody to say like pass a police car at 120. Um, but I, apparently, it was a real young person. If anybody saw the video, it was somebody who lacked driving skill or discretion. All right, so, uh, you know, we've talked so far about getting a ticket or something like that. That's statutory law. 
that comes from statutes that say, don't do this. Uh, statutory law comes from the legislature, either at the state or the federal level. Really, a bunch of people get together who represent you and say, this is what we think the law should be. Like, how old you have to be to do certain things. And at a local level, like um, townships or cities, those statutes are called ordinances. You guys have probably heard that. No <laughs> noise ordinance, zoning ordinance, those are all ordinances, parking. I had an experience last year where, again, I should know the law, but I live in Georgetown Township, and um, I had a pool. I've been putting up small pools for years. Georgetown Township showed up, measured my pool, and told me to take it down. Kids are crying. <laughs> and uh, they said, besides, you didn't get a permit to put it up. Turns out you need a building permit to put up a pool in Georgetown Township. Yep. Building permit. Not just, okay, let me put a pool up, but site plan, where it's going to be, setback requirements, everything. Like and, of course, you pay, well, anything that has more than 24 inches of water. So, you know, anything other than a, a kiddie pool. And there's lots of violations all over the place, but here they come. And mine was just under. So this year, you know, I just basically left the spot out there in the yard for the rest of the year. This year we put up a new pool and I went and pulled a building permit and that was an ordinance and then there was state uh, law that applied to that in terms of what barriers I had to have around it and then I had to pull an electrical permit to put up a pool and I had to have a licensed electrician. So I mean I guess the good thing is then people don't drown or get electrocuted. So there's that. But a lot of ordinances involved in a simple thing like putting a pool up. Uh, sometimes these statutes differ from state to state, like the speed limits in different states are different. Um, in other cases, like the bottom there, there's an attempt to make the law uniform. So when we're talking about contracts for the sale of goods, for example, try not to make it different in every state. There's the Uniform Commercial Code that tries to make it the same regardless of which state you're in. Another source of law is constitutional law. Pretty easy to know where that comes from. Constitution. Uh, every state has a constitution as well as the federal or U.S. constitution. And I use those terms interchangeably, federal, U.S. Uh, the second check mark there under constitutional law will come back to bite you. The U.S. constitution is the supreme law of the land, period. I'll give you some scenario where the Supreme Court is up against the U.S. Constitution. And you're like, oh, Supreme, that sounds good. I'll go with that. But where does the Supreme Court get its jurisdiction from? The Constitution. Now, who interprets the Constitution? The Supreme Court, but, you know, basically the theory is that the Supreme Court or no one else can do something that violates the U.S. Constitution. So that's what we look to as the Supreme Law in the United States. All right, another source of law is administrative law. People usually overlook this one. Like they understand a local ordinance and they can understand the Constitution. But the idea that an administrative agency has the power to create law, a lot of people don't think about that. But actually, there's a huge body of law in administrative law. If you think about anything that ends in TC, CC, FCC, FTC, FDA, all those things are large administrative agencies that create rules. In fact, anybody remember the whole idea of separation of powers and checks and balances and from government? If you look at that slide, an administrative agency seems to have the power to do everything. They come up with their own rules, they figure out who violates them, and then they punish whoever does. So they're actually pretty powerful in their area. Now if they go outside their area, they get their hands slapped. There are some things that kind of put them in their place. Whoever created them could get rid of them. There's been some of that. Like people in administrative agencies really screw up. 
like a nat uh, some natural national disaster and they flub it up, well, guess what? You're reorganized. Um, or take their funding away. You know, if you're not going to do what we tell you to do, then we may take your funding away. All right. And then finally, common law or case law. And as I mentioned earlier, it's a long history, but it's still here today. One of the key concepts is called precedent. See, it's bolded on the slide, and it's spelled differently than president. Basically, the idea is that courts decide cases a certain way, then if they get a similar case again, they ought to stick with it. You shouldn't flip-flop. As we're going to see in a slide coming up here, lower courts need to follow that precedent. So how many sources of American law have I talked about so far? Four. What are they? Statutory. Statutory. Constitutional. Administrative, constitutional, and now common law. Good. In fact, in common law, there's this concept of stare decisis. I may have mentioned this Monday, if not. Occasionally, there'll be a Latin term, and I'll explain it, and I'll say this is important. But I don't expect you to know Latin, a lot of Latin, other than some major topics in your chapter. I am teaching my son Latin, and he is going into fourth grade. I went to law school and never had to take Latin. Anybody else taking Latin? It's just it's interesting how languages are starting earlier and earlier in school. Stare decisis means what? According to your book, or maybe you know Latin. What are you mumbling? What? 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 Yes, that's what it means. What does stare decisis stand for? What's that term mean in English? That basically means stand on decided cases. Once we put our foot down and say this is the law, then we ought to stick with it. So basically, the court doesn't, every time they hear a new case, reinvent the wheel. They go, you know, that sounds familiar. And they go look in the book, uh, the cases are reported, they're organized, and they go, yep, this is what we did before. This is the precedent in this kind of case. And in fact, as I was mentioning, it's binding authority on lower courts. Anybody have a boss that tells them what to do? Yeah? So your boss tells you to do something a certain way. I mean, they kind of let you have a little freedom, but on this they say, do it this way. Now you come in the next day and kind of do whatever you want, right? Completely opposite of whatever they told you to. What's probably going to happen to you? Yeah, eventually. I mean, it depends on who your boss is. First time, maybe, shame on you. Didn't you don't you remember I told you to do it this way? But eventually, they're going to get tired of it. So uh, in the court system, you know, they're going to start sending cases back. No, no, no. You didn't read this case. We already have told you what to do in this kind of situation. All of this supposedly helps courts stay efficient. Now, usually court inefficient in one sentence, you know. Yeah, it is. Has anybody been to court? Is that the first word that came to your mind? No. No. I mean, all you have to do is get excited because you look at your notice that says be there at 930. You're like, woohoo, I'm early. I can get my stuff done, you get there, and everybody for the whole day was told to be there at 9.30. And it doesn't seem efficient at all because by the time you get to your case, eh, judge is gone or adjourned or no one told you or something. So I, don't, I wouldn't go with efficient. I would go with probably this all makes it more efficient than it could be. <laughs> it could be a real mess if they had to re-decide every case, I guess. I suppose. Again, though, having experience in the court system, that varies. 
Some courts are very organized. Um, others are not at all. All right, remedies. Remedies are what you get if you successfully complain to the court and they grant you some kind of remedy or relief. You're not going to get a remedy unless you complain, and you're not going to get a remedy unless you complain to the right place. And we'll talk more about jurisdiction later. Um, but the court can basically give you two major categories of remedies, a remedy at law and an equitable remedy. Um, the easiest way to remember it is remedy at law, money damages. That's what most people are familiar with. When you talk about suing, you know, most people think getting money back. I was harmed. Somebody breached the contract. I want my money back or I want some type of compensation. You get hit in the head, what kind of money damages do you want? Reimbursement for medical expenses, whatever the injury cost you loss of time from work, those type of things, money to represent those things. Um, but there's also uh, equitable remedies. Now, when I say equitable or equity among a bunch of business students, which I realize you're not all business students, how many of you are business students? So, quite a few. Um, when I say equity, you say, well, you think like a home, an equity in a house or a mortgage or or maybe stocks or something like that, you know, if you're in the accounting area. Um, but equity here means what? What did you get from the reading? Or just look up at the slide. Doing what is fair, right? Equitable. Did you say so? Like in so what? Or so is in what's your point? Or? So that would be something. <laughs> that was a weird movie, Anger Management. Um, not so much. I mean, I think you're thinking of it in terms of a criminal case. And in criminal cases, the remedy isn't typically money damages. Um, you might have in a criminal case some type of equitable power, like a restraining order or something like that. Um, but in the, on the criminal side of things, that's largely things like fines, imprisonment, uh, other orders of the court, like you mentioned, community service. Um, but largely what we're talking about here are remedies in a civil case. Um, so what page is this on in your chapter? Is there an exhibit or something in your chapter that kind of lays this out? Page nine. Page nine? or I like to call it Niner. I don't know. Um, so on page 9, uh, you see equitable remedies, and you th see these three types of remedies. And um, these are good examples of what the court could do to be fair. Here, let me give you an example, since you said so. I used to live in Kalamazoo, and I commuted to Grand Rapids for five years. Then I realized one day I, I could move here. <laughs> So I started looking for a house. You guys look for a house ever or a place to rent? What kind of things do you look for? Location. How far is it from my job? What? Cost. Yeah. How much money? You know, what would you say? Parking, you know. Um, what condition is it in? What schools is it near? Et cetera, et cetera. Right. Yeah. Who's going to be around me? Although that's a crapshoot. Um, but I love my neighbors. So, <laughs> so let's say you go through all that, but then you have a spouse who I lo love very much who, like, has to walk into a house and say, I oh, know, this isn't it. There's this kind of, like, this is a home thing. I don't know if it's probably not, not feng shui. I don't know what it is. But there's some type of, like, I could be like, check, 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 let's do it. And she's like, mm, no. So anyway, so we find the house we want. It's got everything. And she walks in, and basically she looks at me like, you're not a man unless you can get me this house. All right? She loves it. So I plunk down my money, and we go all the way to the closing. 
And at the closing, the sellers look over at us and say, we love our house. We've decided not to sell. Well, Meanwhile, I've sold my house in Kalamazoo. I put all our stuff in storage. Uh, we're living up here in an apartment. And now we're, good. we're all excited about moving in. And they go, no, nah, we decided not to. Now, if we were just going to get money, what could we get? All the things I just mentioned, storage and, you know, uh, time out from work to go to this closing and, you know, the, the, the deposit that I put down, I'd want back. Anything else I could come up with, right? What about the fees for the apartment you have? Sure, I mean, I, you know, that might be my choice. Like, it might not be foreseeable to them that I sell my house and move into apartment and et cetera. But if I'm just going to get money, let's say I sue them, which I didn't. Um, and at the end, the judge says, you win. Here's your money. What am I going to do with the money? Another Buy another house. How many houses are like that house? None. Even if you can find the exact same house, it's not on the same piece of property. It's different. Remember, my wife's like, this is it. So i got to get her this house. And what's the only way I can get this house? <laughs> Are you crazy? No, an equitable remedy. An order of the court telling the other party to specifically do what they already promised to do. Basically, the court says, no, no, no. You can't breach the contract. You must sell them the property because it's unique and they can't get it anywhere else. And you promised. And when you did, they relied justifiably. Right? They sold their house. They put things in storage. I mean, this is reasonable stuff. So, you better sell them the house. Now, other things, maybe not so much an equitable remedy. Let's say I buy a, ref buy a refrigerator, and the day it's supposed to come, it doesn't get delivered. What could I do? Get another one, right? I mean, refrigerators, there's a lot of them. They're pretty much alike. You know, if I can find the model and type that I want. So the court's not, if I go all the way through trial, the court's not going to go, well, that's a unique refrigerator. Now, could it be a unique refrigerator? I suppose. Could be a rare, antique ice chest from whatever. But uh, so sometimes when the case is right, the court will use its fairness power, its equitable powers, to give a remedy that is better than money. Because if they give me back 500 bucks that I put down at the, you know, at the closing, I'm going to go, what am I going to do with this? That didn't really happen. I built my house. so, But it's a great example, isn't it? All right, later in the course, I'll ask you about that, and you'll be like, oh, yeah, yeah, the house example, the house example, when you first lied to us. Um, but hopefully you'll remember why I just told that to you. Why did I just tell you that? <laughs> yes, thank you. Yeah, a lot of people are like, oh, yeah, that was a great example, the house. But the reason I told you about the house is because it was an example of needing an equitable remedy because a money or legal remedy wouldn't be enough. Now, sometimes you can get a little of both. Couldn't I get, I mean, I can't get the house and the money for the house, right? Judge, make them sell me the house, but I want my money back. You can't do that. You can't do both of those things. But couldn't I order the, have the court order them to, to sell me the house and get my expenses for having to do that? Sure. They, I mean, they basically came to closing in bad faith and said they didn't want to do it. They could have told me that. All right. Injunction. An order of the court saying stop doing something. Let's say a company's polluting the river. And they figured out it's cheaper to pay the fine every time than it is to not pollute. Well, what would the court eventually do, hopefully sooner than later? Say, you're enjoined from doing that. If you do it, you're going to get fined again. But you, there's also other things that will happen to you for violating an order of the court. Like possibly some of you going to jail because you won't quit disobeying an order of the court. And then rescission is undoing a contract. Rather than enforcing it, making the parties do what they promised to do, you say, well, that's a pretty good reason for one of the parties to get to back out and, like, rewind to where they were. Like in the house example, 
Rather than me saying, I want that house, when do you think I could say, I don't want that house? I want out of my obligation to buy that house. I mean, typically that'd be a breach of contract, wouldn't it? But couldn't I come up with a good reason why I shouldn't have to buy the house? Taunted. I don't know. Yeah. Right, I mean, what if I'm trying to buy a house and they sell it to somebody else? You know, I mean, there's going to be some weird things going on. Or, or what if fraud's been committed? You know, they basically tell me, oh, yeah, it's great condition, never been flooded, blah, blah, blah. And then I find out through inspection it's just a disaster. And they lied to me about everything. I should be able to get out of that. So that's rescission, backing out. All right. So in uh, civil law cases, there's a plaintiff who's injured. And when I say injured, I don't necessarily mean like hit, like a physical injury. It could be financial, emotional, something. The plaintiff initial, initiates the lawsuit, and the defendant who allegedly caused the injury has to answer for it. And they might say, yep, I did it. Unlikely, but possible. Or they might say, no, I didn't. In fact, you injured me. All right. So this is that. This is what's on page nine, right? Does that look familiar? Page 10. Pen, page 10? Okay. Exhibit 1-2, page 10, then. Um, how a lawsuit starts in an action at law. It's a complaint. If it's an equitable action, it's a petition. And let me tell you, like I said... They can be joined these days. Same court. Like when you read that stuff, you get this idea like there's two separate courts. You can go to the same court and ask for both as long as you get, don't get more than what you're entitled to. If it's an action at law, a judge or jury decides the case. If it's an action at equity, the judge decides. Why do you think in a, in a fairness type situation, the judge decides and not the jury? <laughs> yeah, that's one of the big reasons. Like a judge is a lawyer. Not that that makes them that smart, but they know. I've heard a lot of cases, and they kind of have been schooled in it. Juries, not so much. What's the other thing about fairness? What if you all on a jury? Would you all think the same thing is fair? No. Yeah, not likely. So that's one that's not left to a jury to try to balance. Uh, the result in an action at law is a judgment. Like I said, money damages as the remedy. Uh, if it's an equitable action, it's called a decree, and we listed uh, three types of remedies uh, in an action in equity. <coughs> that exhibit is a good one to mark. All right, another way of looking at the law is classifications, categories. There's so much law out there. Uh, and some of these you're probably familiar with. I think everybody understands civil versus criminal law. Although, as we were mentioning uh, Monday, a lot of people have more experience watching criminal law TV shows. Um, where I think a few people struggle is the fact that something could be both civil and criminal. Like if I say OJ, then I think everybody gets it. Everybody, well, I don't know, maybe some of you don't remember it, but when O.J. was on TV in a white blazer running around, what, or was it for Bronco? Bronco. Um, and then he gets tried, uh, and he's acquitted. And then he's sued civilly by the estates of the two deceased, and they successfully recover uh, for wrongful death. Lower burden of proof. They just have to show by a preponderance of the evidence, 51%, some say, so, let's say I slap one of you. Yeah, you ask a question, boom, I slap you. Oh, go ahead. I would say, do you, like, I say, being law and being around the head, do you think it's like, do you think you would be guilty? Um, you know, it doesn't sink and matter. <laughs> you know, I get into these conversations with students, and they're like, he's guilty, he's guilty. And I'm like, you were there. Uh, OJ confided in you. You know, what is it that you possibly not even born at the time, know that that jury who heard all the evidence, even if it was mucked up, 
um, didn't hear. So, and it doesn't matter what I as a prosecutor, attorney, or anybody else other than in that case decides doesn't matter. And I just got a hard concept. Like, I was a prosecutor for five years, but then I did some defense work. I had a private practice, and the court would call me up, and they'd say, this person is a total pain in the behind. We need somebody that can handle this person. So I would go down there and deal with the person. And people would ask me, how can you do that? Knowing these people are guilty, how can you represent them? And I'd say, I'm not the judge and jury. It's not up for me to decide whether they are. Certainly not before I've heard all the evidence. And still, even then, it's up to the judge or jury to decide. So it's, it's, that is maybe an offhanded answer to your question. Is, um, I think it was just like whether or not it was a good case. Like, I, don't, I guess I don't know much about it. I never got to see it. Yeah, I mean, there was, there was so much of, well, if you got enough money, you can hire defense attorneys who can throw up a smoke screen. But then if you ask the defense bar, they'd say, we've never seen prosecution bungle a case as bad as that. Law enforcement, police officers screwed it up. Um, you know, regardless of whether you brought into the whole idea that it was a uh, some type of racially biased prosecution, there were some basic evidential things that were mucked up. So, you know, I would probably fall short of saying they deserved to lose, but I mean, if they had actually won, a lot of people would have said, "Really." But then the flip side of it, with as bad as you screwed it up, you still were able to overcome the burden of proof. Yeah. A couple of things. When I talk about the civil case, that has never made it to our culture because that gets made fun of so much. Right. You know, they right. Fun of it on the side note show. Yeah. You know, when, when you had God, when you had that black, black um, defense attorney try to come up with Kramer and then, then try to sue the uh, heirs to the uh, Katie Bar Foundation trying to wear a bra and it's pretty bra and wear a shirt like. I don't remember that, but um, yeah, I you know I do think I you know I teach courses online and I have a lot of students who say, you know, just look at OJ. There's an example of somebody who had a lot of money and therefore was able to get get away with it. And you know the fact that he had a you know they were actually called a dream team. Eh, okay, but you know there's both sides of it. Every time somebody says a star or public person got away with something, you know. All right, well, let's move on. Um, let's say I slap one of you, which I won't. This is just an example. So um, if I did, civilly, you as the plaintiff could sue me, the defendant, and try to recover money damages. We mentioned them, maybe hospital bills, embarrassment, whatever it is. Uh, it's you between me, or civilly it might be a person against their government. But in a criminal case, if I smack you, I could be prosecuted criminally for that, but you would not be a party. I'd still be the defendant, but the people, you all, would be the plaintiff. What interest do all of you have in me not slapping one person? Yeah, I might slap you all. So, um, yeah, I mean, and sometimes that means putting me where I can't slap you uh, and rehabilitating me, you know, put me through slap therapy or something. Isn't it true? Because I know there's, in civil court, there's a small claims court. Yes, that, there in is. In criminal court, you just have one court, but in small claims court, you cannot appeal, whereas in criminal court, you can appeal and appeal and appeal the decision, but isn't it true that you cannot appeal a small claims court decision? Um... All those things that you said, there's exceptions. And, you know, in fact, here's a general rule. You'll hear me say it throughout the course. It depends. I mean, the answer to almost every question in the law, like on that first slide, is not black letter law. Here it is. It's um, Now, you might voluntarily give up a right to appeal. You might say in your contract of employment, I will submit any disputes I have my employer to arbitration, and whatever is decided, I won't appeal it anywhere. Um, uh, a lot of cases, um, there may not be much of an appeal process. But, you know, the first time I say, yes, you can appeal that case, what if somebody could establish the judge or magistrate was paid off? Oh, too bad, you're stuck with it. So the answer is almost always it depends. 
So national versus international law, I think most folks get that. So either one country's law or law that relates to a number of countries. Uh, the one thing I want you to get in, out of this without having to identify which country has which type of law is that some countries use a civil law system and some countries use a common law system. What kind of country do you know of that uses a common law system? And yes, us, right? So remember, common law is case law. Uh, civil law system is more like code, like statute. Like somebody does something, you open the book, see if you can find it in there. Um, but other than that, that's pretty much it for classifications. Now, you probably again had a lot of this in some kind of government class. Let's focus in on the bottom there where it talks about the roles of each of these branches of government as it relates to law. The legislative branch is primarily responsible for enacting or creating law. What kind of law is that? <coughs> legislative would be statutory law. Executive branch, uh, which includes more than law enforcement, is responsible for enforcing the law. Now, let me tell you, any of these branches of government can Remember we were talking about administrative agencies? Any of these branches of government can have their own laws, but their primary role in this balance of power is listed here. And the judicial branch is interpreting or declaring something to be constitutional or not. Now, notice the top bullet. Back in the day when I was a teenager, the country was being formed. And, um, you know, you might remember a little of your history. Some people were all paranoid about a central government. You know, what's that? Big Brother. Yeah, exactly. Still are today, but, you know, back then they, you know, were all against tyranny and all that. And then there were others like, oh, I don't want to do it on our own. You know, we want something centralized. So the, I'm probably just massacring this. Somebody who's a history buff saying that's not exactly how it happened. But uh, the idea is that, the Constitution gives some powers to a centralized government, Congress, for example, and then the rest belongs to the state. That's pretty much the way it works. Some people think like the U.S. Constitution must relate to just the U.S. or federal government, but really the Constitution says these things are reserved for the federal government. The rest you all decide. Um, talk a little bit about the Commerce Clause because we're talking about constitutional law. Not that important to business, but got to be mentioned because it's in Article 1, Section 8. The U.S. Constitution gives Congress the power to regulate commerce in these three areas. See, here's the first example of you regulate here, here, and here. Everything else, states, you figure out. Foreign nations, among the several states, which has been interpreted as what? What do you guys think among the several states? Interstate commerce. So the chapter talks about that. It doesn't say interstate commerce anywhere in the Constitution, but that's what the courts have interpreted that to mean. That if it's talking about commerce from state to state, then Congress has the ability to regulate that. And then with casinos, no, with Indian tribes. You know, casinos has been one that has been a big Indian uh, law area lately. Uh, but again, you guys probably already know that, you know, even in Michigan, and there's been controversy over casino, there's been state influences play, and it's not all just federal government. Um, so, what did I say that was totally ridiculous and somebody should have challenged me on? And it's recorded now. Did I warn you guys last time I might say something that was... Maybe something you ought to challenge me on that might be contra contrary to what you read. I didn't warn you. I should have. <coughs> should I have to? Should you all just sit there and suck up everything I say and believe all of it? You already know I'll lie to you. Right? <laughs> so, well, if you play back this audio, you'll hear me say, you know, 
the Commerce Clause is not all that important to business, but it is in the Constitution, so we do need to talk about it. That's what I said when I put the slide up. You know, like, eh, okay, next slide. Now, what's the second bullet say? It has the greatest impact on business than any other Constitution. Even if that wasn't up there, who can think like Commerce Clause and think that doesn't relate to business? Somebody should have been, wait a minute, what did you ingest, smoke, drink this morning? That doesn't make sense what you just said. But you're all either not listening to me or thinking, oh, he couldn't be wrong. What's that? You're like, I trusted you, man. Go out to rateyourprofessor.com and give me a liar button or something. Is that? Yeah, a half star. All right. Uh, so it's really important because how much commerce is really local these days? I mean, you might go down the street and buy something somebody made. Like, we keep going down the street and buying corn on the cob. It's Oh, man, is it good. Um, or lemonade. My kids sell lemonade. But other than that, you know, um, who knows where you're buying it from or where it was made. So, really, I'm not going to ask you, tell me, you know, on a quiz, what are the facts of Gibbons versus Ogden? I'm not going to do that. But I want you to see, over time, how the U.S. Supreme Court has loosened its interpretation of the Commerce Clause. So, back in 1824, when I graduated from high school, <laughs> um, there was the court saying that anything that substantially affects more than one state should be considered interstate commerce. That means even if it originates in just one state, if the court can establish that it affects, substantially affects other states, that's good enough. And the national government has the exclusive power. So regulate most everything and only we can regulate it. That's a pretty strict interpretation. Um, but today, you know, the Internet really isn't that old. Um, certainly back in 1824, in this case, it decided no one was thinking about e-commerce. I thought it was a good example. Um, in fact, here's how ridiculous it's, it's, it's getting or it was getting back then, is there's this case, Wickard versus Filburn, which is what I'm going to name my next two children. Yeah. Come here, little Wicker, little Filburn. Um, this farmer grows his own wheat and consumes it. And the courts say, well, yes, it might seem like local production, <coughs> but the fact that he's eating that bread keeps others from getting it in interstate commerce. That's how far they were willing to reach to say Congress can regulate. I mean, can you think of anything more local? Growing your own stuff and eating it? I can't. So the law starts to change. Um, in 64, there's this case, Heart of Atlanta Motel versus U.S. What case is that on? Or what page is that on? 13. That's an interesting case because it's not really uh, challenging Congress's authority to regulate interstate commerce. What kind of challenge was this? And if anybody know your history, you, 1964 will give you a hint. The Civil Rights Act of 1964, right? So uh, back then, they were implementing civil rights and this uh, hotel comes along and says we only advertise locally we don't put signs out on the interstate we're not out there trying to pull people in from other states uh, and the fact that you're creating this law that affects my business that's purely local is interfering in intrastate commerce intra meaning only within one state Bad, stupid case. I mean, something in the title should give you a hint that this business deals in interstate commerce. 
What is it? No, you, you said heart of Atlanta, V-U-S. You guys skipped the word. That's the important word. Motel. What are motels for? Oh, careful. Yes, they're for traveling interstate commerce, right? I mean, you don't, well, I don't know. Sometimes, like, the local hotels are trying to say, bring your kids for a staycation and all this. But outside of that, the people who are staying there are from somewhere else. So if you're going to challenge the law by arguing you're just dealing locally, probably being a motel is the bad challenge. Thanks. Yeah. So today, today, um, there's still the ability for the federal government to regulate in areas that substantially affect interstate commerce, but the Supreme Court has, shall we say, curbed their enthusiasm. Um, more, I put more practical limits on that in terms of, uh, and we'll see it on an upcoming slide here, allowing the states even to regulate in areas that might affect interstate commerce, as long as they don't go too far. So um, before I jump into states area, uh, let me give you an example. Um, there's a state a long time ago that passed a law that said trucks that come through our state have to have mud flaps. Who's in favor of mud flaps? I don't know. Who cares? But let's say it's a good idea because you won't get a rock thrown at you or something. Safety. And so they, somebody went to court and challenged that because if, if I go through that state, i got to put mud flaps on. And the court said, you know what? We're going to let the states in the interest of safety of their citizens regulate that because just put them on. Then you're good to go in every state. It's not an undue burden on interstate commerce. Then another state came along and said, we want you to have round corners on your mud flaps. So I don't know why. Maybe since nobody gets poked in the eye by a flying mud flap or something. <laughs> what do you think the court said about that? I mean, what would you have to do when you come to a state where you got square, you got corners on them and they want you to round them off? I right. <laughs> Be out there trimming them, I guess. That'd probably, that'd probably be an undue burden on interstate commerce. What else might you do? What's that? Yeah, then, you know, then switch them. And then that would be good in every state until someone else came up with some other stupid thing about mud flaps, right? But what the other thing could do is not go through the state. That's the big problem. If you force interstate commerce to avoid your state, that's really suspect. Now, there are some cases where the court has went as far as saying, in the interest of state safety, we're going to let them do that. Like, if you go out west, you see these huge uh, triple trailers and stuff like that. You don't see those here in Michigan. So, and sometimes the, the state can create laws that maybe because people to do, you know, specific things as they come through the state, and the court won't say it's unreasonable. All right, the tenth, tenth Amendment reserves all powers of the state that aren't expressly given to the national government, including police powers. Police power means more than just the police. The ability to regulate health, safety, morals, general welfare. We mentioned some of these before. Parking, zoning, building permits, licensing, you know, being a licensed attorney, physician, counselor, whatever it is. Those are all controlled at a state level. But there's also, on the state side, the dormant commerce clause. Remember, commerce clause is relating to the federal government's power to regulate interstate commerce. Uh, so the flip side of this is the state, it's behind the screen, um, the state has uh, limited power to regulate in areas that might affect interstate commerce as long as they don't go too far. At least that must be what it says on the next page because there's an arrow there. Right. So even though some may say that the federal government has the exclusive power, the states can regulate in areas that might affect interstate commerce as long as there's a balancing going on there. Um, that's why some states is different than other states. All right, the supremacy clause. And the short of it is, and again, you see that supreme law of the land. 
short of it is, if there's a conflict between federal and state law, the feds win. If it's an area that the feds are supposed to be regulating in, I mean, the bummer of it is that maybe the feds choose not to act and then the states do something. Then the feds come along and say, okay, now we're going to create law. They still win. If, it's, if they were the ones authorized to do it, in fact, that, that idea is called preemption. If they choose to act in an area that they have the authority to act and then the state acts, federal law preempts the state law. Yeah, Trump. That's a good word for it. Not as in Donald, but as in cards. All right. A, a lot of you have... Who hasn't heard of the Bill of Rights? <coughs> okay, so we've all heard of it today, uh, and we know that it applies to both the federal government and the state government. Um, when we're talking about the Bill of Rights, we're basically talking about uh, the government not interfering with your individual rights. We're not talking about other people committing a tort against you. We're talking about the government acting in a ways that interferes with your individual rights or liberties, either federal or state government. And now specifically, because this is business law, we're talking about business. So some of these protections that are in the Bill of Rights also apply to businesses, even though... Obviously, you go to the Bill of Rights, it doesn't have a footnote that says, you know, also applies to business, right? The courts have interpreted that, well, that must have been what the constitutional framers meant. It didn't, they didn't exclude businesses. Businesses include people, so it applies. So you may have heard of freedom of speech before. But you may not know that speech includes more than what you say. It might be uh, something you do, something you wear, a gesture. Um, and basically, if the government interferes with that, then it's suspect. You know, why is the government trying to restrict your ability to say something? Um, but we're going to find in the business setting, there are good reasons why the business might restri restrict the ability to speak about a product, for example. Um, Here's an example. Corporate political speech. Shouldn't corporations have an opportunity to uh, express their opinion to? Now, there's some financing laws around campaign financing, but, you know, uh, a corporation ought to be able to take a position on something. In fact, some corporations are formed to take a position on something. There's some examples up there. But there's this whole idea of commercial speech, too. And when I say commercial speech, I mean commercials, but I also mean corporate speech. How do corporations speak? Obviously, the building doesn't talk. So they primarily speak about what? If it's not political, it's marketing, advertising, what they say about themselves, their products. So... Um, here's an example, case 1.2, Bad Frog Brewery, which actually was a Michigan beer. Um, they, they were doing well. Their claim to fame was a frog on the label who had its middle finger up, and it was bad, and so everybody wanted it. So they were moving to New York, and the New York State Liquor Authority said, oh, no, no, we don't want your bad frog here. We've got kids here, you know. We don't want our kids seeing no frog with a middle finger. Now, aside from the fact that frogs don't have fingers, uh, and kids, you know, why are kids in bars looking at beer? Um, the case goes to court, and the government has the burden of establishing those three things that are checked up there. You should know those three things. A, B, and C. Right? So... If Bad Frog challenges the government, which is in this case is the New York State Liquor Authority, the government has the burden of showing that what they did, banning the label from being in their state, sought to implement some substantial governmental interest. Is it important to protect children from seeing obscene things? You can't hear all of them, but they're all saying yes. 
down with obscenity for children. Um, Right, right, and I think that's the second one, directly advance that interest. Well, okay, let's say an outright ban does, but man, good luck with that. You know, you think a frog with his middle finger up is bad. Wait, you know, look at what's on TV, look what's in the stores. My favorite is uh, in Kalamazoo, they opened up a brand new family video. And I'm like, awesome, let's go down to family video, right? Take the family in there and... My son's like, why are all those men going in the back room, Dad? <laughs> they all have to use the bathroom right now, I guess. Right? Yes. I mean, so I quit taking my kids to video stores years ago because they quit having another room. They just started putting it out there. And they'd be like, Dad, what's that? What are they doing? I'm like, no, don't look at that. So now we just do it through Netflix, <laughs> which is another issue. I came home one day and my wife said, you realize through Netflix you can get access to things that our kids shouldn't see? And I'm like, yeah, that's why I always do it for them. She said, that's a good idea. All right, then the last one, must go no further than necessary to accomplish. If you, if you get a scenario that, that says the government's banning speech, a red flag should go up, right? So it's kind of presumed that's bad, unless that's the only way you can stop it. You remember Joe Camel? Maybe you don't because he's gone, right? Um, or the Flintstones. There's videos of, of, on YouTube of the Flintstones during their break. They'd be smoking cigarettes and advertising the cigarette in the cartoon. And the government said, oh, no, no, none of that. So there are times where the government's successful in saying, the only way we can quit this is to, to ban it. So, um, but in this case, like we were saying, couldn't you just sell beer in places where kids are not going to see the label? Or what, what else do they have in stores and they cover up so kids can't see it? Not that you have. What's that? I don't know what that is, but... Oh, okay, so, yeah, just put something over it so people can't see it. Uh, or, you know, there's magazines that are up where kids can't see it or they're covered up or something like that. Uh, so there's things you can do without absolutely banning it. Yeah, I mean, there, there's definitely a height relation there. So put them up where kids can't see the stuff. Now, this one will get you. Uh, protection of speech doesn't mean all speech is protected. If I defame somebody, if I say something about them that's not true to harm their good reputation, uh, if I threaten them, you know, if I call in a bomb threat, I can't go, oh, free speech. Um, fighting words, I'm not sure what that is. Maybe it's want to fight. Like inciting a riot or something like that. Or obscene speech, underlying. You're going to see this and you're going to go, oh, you know, that's protected. It's not. If it can be established that it's obscene, it's not protected by the First Amendment. Now, establishing that the speech is obscene is a challenge, right? Because here's the definition. Patently offensive on its face, as the Supreme Court says, you know it when you see it, you hear it. Violates community standards, has no literary, artistic, political, or scientific merit. Well, getting people to agree or court to agree on what has absolutely no merit, that's tough. But if we can, if we can say this is patently offensive, it's not protected by the First Amendment. What's defamatory, speech? defamatory speech is defaming or saying something about somebody that's not true and harming their good reputation. So if one of you said, I was convicted for embezzling a client's money, that would be very harmful to my occupation. Does that apply to <clears throat> Yeah, somewhat. I mean, that you know, you if you're in a, like a marketing area where you're saying our product's better than yours these days, you know, toughen up. But if it's intentionally saying something about somebody else that you know is not true to try to harm the, the competition, then that's not protected. All right. Uh, and that obscenity could be online also. So again, if it is obscene, 
You know, a lot of people will agree that pornography on the internet is obscene. However, there's a lot of federal law to try to regulate it. Does that mean there's no pornography on the internet? That's not what it means. Uh, you can find it without even looking for it. But it's a little bit of a challenge. Like one of these laws talks about um, you should not depict children engaged in sexual acts on the internet. How many people are in favor of that? Banning that. The, all, everybody's hands, except this one guy here, uh, went up. Um, here, I'm looking. Who, who, who is it? Um, so, yeah, we're, we're pretty much against that. Um, and so somebody challenged that and said, well, I'm an artist, and I use computers, and I can generate an image that looks exactly like children doing this on the Internet, but it's not really children. So I feel your federal law is infringing on my ability to express myself artistically. And the court believed it. So it's a challenge online. I remember one time um, I was part of Jennifer Granholm's at the time. She was the attorney general. First Internet Task Force. And we would train police officers to get AOL screen names. That's how long it goes. AOL was actually around. They still are, but anyway and go into chat rooms and say, I'm Johnny, I'm 12, I like teddy bears. And so they're in a training session, and sure enough, within like 30 seconds, here comes somebody, hey, Johnny, what do you know? I live right by you, and I like teddy bears too. Maybe I can meet you and do this and do this and do this. I'll be driving this van, wearing these clothes, and I'll have a teddy bear for you. So they all decide to do a little field exercise, and they go down, and here's the guy by the van, with clothes on, with the teddy bear, ready to do all the things he described to do. And they arrest him because little Johnny's not little Johnny, he's a six foot four state trooper. Now, what did they arrest him for? They didn't solicit a child or minor. He solicited a, a fictitious character. Trying to? Can you try to solicit a fictional character? Really? Yeah. I, Do you think that, you know, it's a 12-year-old, you're trying to solicit a 12-year-old, you're not anticipating that it's a real man? I think. Can I get in trouble for what I think or what I intend? Because right now I'm in trouble then. <laughs> I mean, seriously, if, if all you needed to do was think or intend something without acting on it, you know, remember Minority Report? Anybody see that movie? Oh, yeah. You know, they just bust in through your ceiling and arrest you before you do it. So it can't be just, well, I wanted to. So what? Can he be in a park with clothes on? With a teddy bear? I know. So everybody says they're like, okay, maybe I don't remember back when this law came out, but I know that show where the guy shows up in the house and he's trying to explain where all the things he's got in his pocket and... Yeah, so, yeah, this, this is the challenge. Those are challenging issues. How far is enough acting? I mean, you don't have to catch them in the act. Uh, so they've modified some of the laws to say that if you do certain things, even though if you don't actually do the act that you describe, that's sufficient. So getting on the Internet and saying that you're going to do certain things is against the law, like bombing a school. You can't call and say, I'm going to bomb the school. You'd never bomb the school, but the act of calling over a phone and saying that is criminal. So, but it's tough. That one was challenged. All right. And then, you know, basically there's a whole lot of things that you can say and see on the Internet that you couldn't do in this room, including hate speech. You know, there's all kinds of sites uh, that you could find out there. All right, freedom of religion. A lot of people think this is the Constitution saying separation of church and state. What time is it? Quarter to ten. Okay. That says a quarter till five. So it's, the clock's behind the. Yeah. Can you see it? I can like see what? Like it's like why is it on a five there? So anyway, all right, good. We'll get through this. So freedom of religion, a lot of people think that the Constitution says there's a separation church and state. It doesn't. It's nowhere in there. You can go online and do a word search of it. You won't find it. 
but there there is in the First Amendment two clauses, one related to the establishment of a religion and the other related to the free exercise of religion. So the state, the government, cannot sponsor or establish a religion. Now, when's the last time the government said, Here, hereby, from now on, the religion of the United States is officially whatever? Over? Yeah, maybe. <laughs> but outside of that, that doesn't happen, right? Nobody's that bold, although, you know, there might be some people who would like to do that. Um, but, you know, there have been challenges that by the government, by funding or supporting or whatever is actually establishing a religion or preferring one over another in their decisions. And the other part of it is the government should not interfere with your free exercise of your religion. Again, is this absolute? No. no more than you can absolutely speak freely about anything. Yes? And what about uh, everybody again voting for against the mosque going up in New York? Right. That's a good example. You know, should you be able to speak freely about that? What is sure. That? Well, I, I, I mean, the short of it, I believe, is that they're trying, they're going through some historical clearing process and get the permission to build a community center slash mosque uh, at Ground Zero, thereabouts. And a lot of people are upset about that, and a lot of people are in support of that. Um, the mayor of New York, I mean, there's people taking sides in that. And... So I think in terms of speaking freely about it, nobody has a question, but the freedom of religion is one issue. Well, if the United States means they won't endorse a particular religion or prevent somebody from freely exercising religion, free exercise includes where we put our, where we practice it. So um, it'll be interesting. All right, so... Uh, yeah, and this, you know, this kind of gets at one of those issues, but the other thing I'll say about it is that you can practice a religion as long as you don't go too far and interfere with someone else's constitutional rights. So the government says they don't want to get involved in it, but if you start human sacrifice, then maybe we'll, you know, have to step in. And there have been other issues which are, you know, blood transfusion, smoking peyote. I mean, there's a variety of different issues where the government, right, you know, can can you... You know, if the child is an adult, should should they get medical treatment or not? All right, due process. Due process has a lot to do with that fairness concept. That idea that, well, let's back up a minute. Nowhere in the Constitution does it say the government can't kill you, take everything away from you, or put you away forever. It doesn't say that. It just says it has to do it fairly. <laughs> so we can do those things as long as you get notice and an opportunity to be heard by somebody who's fair and impartial. So, you know, take M6 as an example. I'm from Hastings. And uh, back in the day when I drove the Hastings, it was a long way getting there, and I had to go all the way around the north part of Grand Rapids, etc. Uh, and there was a lot of farmers' fields. Now there's a big highway through there. And it got there because one day the government said, we need this. Now, they didn't come down there with tanks and take it. They said, hey, everyone, we need this. And we have a public purpose for it. And so due process required people who own the property to find out, to know, to have an opportunity to object. And then if the government was able to take it under constitutional power to take then they should get fairly compensated for it. Isn't that also under domain? Yes, that would be the power that they used. And some people would argue whether the compensation was fair or not. But uh, So due process is all about doing what's fair. Now there's two aspects to this, procedural and sub substantive. Procedural are kind of what your rights are. You know, you have a right to your property, the government might have the right to take it. The substantive part about it is how you get those rights. Right? So let's say, for example, what give me a right. right there. It always makes me nervous when all my students say that, but 
<laughs> right, I mean, but what does that look like if you can't actually get one? You can run around, you know, if somebody breaks into your house, you can shout, I have the right to bear arms, but unless you got it, or you're able to have access to it, subject to certain limitations, why you shouldn't have one, right? Like, at school, you too. Don't bring it in my class. Um, that's the substantive part of it. How do you get those rights? Now, if it's a fundamental right, the government should not be messing with it. Your chapter talks about those First Amendment rights, like interstate travel, religion, those things that are fundamental, versus non-fundamental. If it's just an economic interest, then the government can pretty much do what they want as long as they can come up with some rational reason for doing it. All right, equal protection. The government does not have to treat everybody the same. I think a lot of people think the Constitution says, government has to treat me the same as you. Um, but the courts have interpreted that to mean similarly situated people. All you got to do is think about sentencing in a, in a criminal case. Does everybody who gets sentenced get the same exact sentence? No. no. What's one of the big things that affect whether somebody gets the same sentence? Yes, you know, either you die or you don't. Right. You know, are you in the similar, same situation or not? Maybe one of you has been doing it your whole life. The other is first offense. So, if you are the same, in the same situation, then the government should teach you the same, more or less, within sentencing guidelines. Um, now, Sometimes people raise an equal protection argument um, in the most novel ways. For example, anybody ever heard of the cussing canoeist? Yeah. Guy's canoeing, falls out of his canoe, cusses. He cusses, there's a woman, child, maybe off-duty police officer on the uh, side of the river who hear it, and he gets prosecuted over a 100-plus-year-old statute that says you can't swear in front of women and children. Goes to court. What do you think the, de the defense attorney challenged about that law. No! What slide are we on? Everybody falls for this, by the way. Well, yeah, you're getting to the conclusion, but is obscene speech protected under the First Amendment? No. No. So if, it, if, if he said, and he let loose, you know, very, you know, the F-bomb and various other words, clearly it was obscene under the statute. So the government, or the like I said, the defense attorney was more creative, and we're on the slide, so that's the hint. He argued that why is it that men can't swear in front of women, but women who now swear like sailors can't can get away with it? Well, yeah, <laughs> yeah, this is true too. But the court ended up saying, you know, you're right. That's gender discrimination. And according to your chapter, the pages is on these levels of scrutiny. It's important for you to look at. What? 25? Which level of scrutiny did the court apply to that challenge? Gender discrimination. Look at minim minimum, intermediate, and strict scrutiny in your book. If the challenge is based on gender, it's intermediate scrutiny. Remember, it says, it says in there, gender and legitimacy. So if somebody says, I'm a male and I'm being treated than a, different than a female, that's gender discrimination. That's intermediate scrutiny. And that means the government has the burden of proving what? What does it say? Anybody find intermediate scrutiny? In harder standards to meet that of intermediate, intermediate scrutiny is applied to cases involving discrimination based on gender or legitimacy. That's true. Laws using these classifications must be substantially related to an important government objective. So, substantially related to an important government. They have to show a good reason, an important reason, why they're discriminating against men in this statute. And like you said, that was 100 years ago. They went back and they looked at legislative history. Why do you think the statute said can't swear in front of women? They believed if you swear in front of women, they will pass out and faint. It's a safety issue. They're flopping left and right. You know, they're falling in the street, getting run over if you swear in front of them. So, but we know now today that's not true. Strict scrutiny, fundamental rights, speech, religion, interstate travel, all those things. If the government messes with that, 
It's presumed to be unconstitutional. Minimal scrutiny. I want to have a hot dog stand downtown. The city tells me, no, nope, we got too many already. It's purely an economic interest. They're not discriminating based on the fact I'm a male or my race or anything else. All we got to do is come up with a good reason for it. Health, whatever it is. All right, and then last, I'll end it on this one. Uh, but listen carefully. Privacy. There is no right to privacy in the federal constitution. You can look up and down. It doesn't say you have a right to privacy. It emanates from the penumbras. That's what the Supreme Court said. I'm like, oh, that must have hurt. Um, penumbras, shadows. It's, it's there, but you don't really see it because it comes from things like the Fourth Amendment. If the framers of the Constitution said you need a search warrant based on probable cause before you go into somebody's houses, they must have thought that was a private area. But it doesn't say all that. It's just, a, you guys getting the idea? The Constitution said this, Supreme Court comes along and says this is what it means, and now there's this right to privacy, and that's been expanded, as you can see from the case there, to other areas. But there's different expectations of privacy in different areas. At work, if you put something in your desk drawer, or you're doing something on a computer, is there, should you have a reasonable expectation that's going to remain private? If you do, you shouldn't. <coughs> You, I get people who are like, oh, I sent it from my personal email. I'm like, seriously? At work from a network that somebody's monitoring? Not good. Yeah. I mean, it's, the stuff is being looked at. So uh, your house is a different story. So, all right, we'll stop there. Pick up next Wednesday, right? With chapter what? No, three.